Hi, everyone. I'm Wes Radies, the Executive Director of Bay Nature. Welcome to today's Bay Nature Talk with Michael Marciano about tarantulas, the gentle giants of Mount Diablo. Bay Nature is a nonprofit, independent media organization devoted to environmental journalism covering the San Francisco Bay Area. We publish the quarterly Bay Nature magazine, plus a weekly email newsletter, social media channels, and a website at baynature.org. Bay Nature Talks bring our stories to life and connect you more deeply with experts in the field. As many of you already know, early fall is tarantula mating season, and today's talk is a response to the tremendous interest we received to a September Bay Nature hike that took readers to Mount Diablo in search of male tarantulas seeking out females in their burrows. This afternoon, we'll go deeper to learn more about the lives of tarantulas and their mating habits, as well as the best places to discover these spiders in the wild. Before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. If you have any technical difficulties, please know that this webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent to you after the event. If you have any questions during today's talk, please enter them using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer as many as possible after the main presentation. We also wanna thank everyone who made a $20 donation to support today's talk. Bay Nature receives 50% of our income from donations and your gifts make events like this possible. We invite you to donate and to subscribe at baynature.org. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Michael Marciano. Michael is an experienced Mount Diablo Interpretive Association naturalist and has led hikes during tarantula mating season for over 40 years, educating the public about the lives of these gentle and harmless giants. A local expert on Bay Nature, uh, excuse me, on Bay Area tarantula species, Michael takes special interest in correcting urban myths and folklore about many wild creatures that live in our area, especially those concerning spiders and snakes. Today, Michael will share a retrospective of learnings, observations, and stories from decades tracking tarantulas across the mountain ranges of the San Francisco Bay Area. He'll explain the basic biology of the many species of tarantula living in California, dispel myths and misconceptions, and share how climate change is impacting local habitats. Welcome, Michael. We thank you for being with you. Excuse me. We thank you for being with us today. And please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Wes, for that very cordial introduction. It's my pleasure to be here with the group from Bay Nature. I feel this group especially is a, a kind of like talking to the choir. Um, one of the things not mentioned is that I was born and raised in Contra Costa County. And for the my lifetime, which is now 75 years, I've been a naturalist since I was in the last 70 years. I was the five-year-old who came home with the frogs in his pockets and uh, the butterflies in a jar, um, fossils he found on the ground. And most of the time, it wasn't just to collect, but rather I was curious about each and every one of these animals, each and one of these things. That interest has stayed to me till this day. Um, I cannot emphasize enough that wanting to gain the knowledge and understanding of these creatures, where they come from, how they live, who they relate with, uh, how they exist in our ecosystems is really the wonderful joy. Uh, it's just not the knowledge that they do exist, but rather their interrelationships. Um, with that, I'm going to explain how I first came into my interest with tarantulas. As I mentioned, I was born and raised in this area, and I had gone up on Mount Diablo several times as a child. Uh, one of my greatest experiences, in fact, was at nine years old. Having lived here all my life, I'd never seen snow, and it snowed on Mount Diablo. And so my mother had taken us up there and, you know, we got a snowball fights and brought home a snowman on our car. And that's just a little side vignette. But because of this, I also camped up there in the, usually in springtime, early in the year, when it's green and it's nice, it's not that dry, hot weather of summer and fall. So I never really explored Mount Diablo at that time of year. And at the age of 19 years old, I was... Uh, attending St. Mary's College, and a friend of mine from Southern California and I were together, and I suggested to him to take a ride up the mountain to take a view of the greater area. I was going to show him where I had lived and grew up and a little bit of the history of the area. And as we're driving up the road, all of a sudden I yelled to him, stop, stop. 
hit the brakes of the car and he goes, what, what's wrong? And I said, there's a giant spider crossing the road. Now, as I mentioned, I'd been going up there all my life, but I had never seen a tarantula. I was unaware of tarantulas on Mount Diablo. All I knew about tarantulas came from the media. Number one, they were deadly poisonous. Number two, they could jump three to six feet. Number four, they attacked people. Number five, if I was going to get out, I better be awful careful with this fearsome creature. On the other hand, that interest as a naturalist was not going to deter me. So I jumped out of the car. I had nothing to put it in, so I took off my shoe, my sock. I brought it over. I picked up a stick, and I coaxed this vicious creature to crawl into my sock, which I then tied into a knot. I brought it home, and this was in October or November of 1969. I set up a terrarium. And you have to remember now, 1969, there was no internet. Uh, internet in those days was the Encyclopedia Britannica. I tried to look up information and could find very little. I next tried to make contact with the University of California, Berkeley, uh, UC Davis, and then the Academy of Sciences. But I could not find anyone who knew anything about the native California tarantulas found on Mount Diablo. I did know that they were predators like all spiders that they ate insects and other arthropods. So I put crickets in there, I put a little water dish. And for the next couple of months, I watched the spider daily in this terrarium wander around, trying to figure out something more about it. I did not know if it was a male or a female, um, knew nothing really about that venom. So slowly but surely over the years then, I started to learn more about these creatures. Now, to be debunk some of my first statements, tarantulas are not poisonous to human beings whatsoever. In the world, there are over 850 recognized species of tarantulas, and probably another several hundred that have not yet been discovered, or at least categorized. Um, of those, not one, not one species is deadly to man. Contrary to what we see on the movies, Contrary to what you can hear, read in the media, they are not dangerous. Our local one in particularly, uh, its venom has no potency to a person. Many articles I read talk about it being the severity of a bee sting. Well, I will tell you, a bee sting is very painful. And for me, at least, it's still swelled up and hurts the next day. Because of the last 50 years of handling tarantulas, I've improperly grabbed one or picked one up and I have been bitten three times in self-defense. I was never attacked by a spider. Spiders do not attack people, but they will bite in self-defense. And in the cases that the spider bit me, every one of them was deserving. Of those three times, not once did I have any reaction to the biting. The most pain involved is like taking two little pins and pricking yourself. That would be the fangs entering you, then they remove the fangs, and there is no swelling, no redness, and no offense from the, from the bite. So that's the first one to be debunked. Secondly, tarantulas are slow moving. They are not quick or fast. They do not take to attack people. They are unable to jump. They do not have the hydraulics of a tiny small jumping spider, for instance. And so jumping is not in their capacity. So all of these different myths I had read Slowly over the years, by my observations, I was able to debunk these. Jumping forward now, a couple of years, about 20 years later, through Lindsay Museum, I was leading hikes. And I started up the first original tarantula hikes of Mount Diablo. And it was on these hikes, in fact, that I started to really get some more knowledge of these individuals. So for this afternoon, to get an understanding of these gentle spiders, the gentle giants, first of all, a little understanding of, of spiders in general. Spiders are in the phylum of arthropods. The arthropods include the insects. They include arachnids. They include uh, the, um, the um, crabs and lobsters, all jointed legged creatures. The other characteristic they have is an exoskeleton. And this is going to come into play as I discuss how they grow and how they live. Because creatures with an exoskeleton must molt or shed those exoskeletons in order to survive. 
they do not grow with the individual. So let's take this now from the time that a tarantula is born to the time that the tarantula becomes an adult and mates and discuss a little bit about that. A mother tarantula in springtime, or late winter actually, she starts off by knitting what I refer to as a silk pillowcase. Since uh, tarantulas are arachnids and they're in the group megalomorphs, uh, let me explain that one real quick. In the spider world, there are two groups, megalomorphs and arenomorphs. 80% of the spiders you see are arenomorph. The megalomorphs are the older and more archaic spiders, in fact, lived at the times of the dinosaurs and before. So the tarantulas have been around for a long time. But all spiders spin silk. Not all spiders spin webs. Commonly, we think of a spider as the large spider web with the spider in the middle of it. But such spiders as crab spiders, jumping spiders, wolf spiders, these are all hunting spiders, and they do not spin webs, but rather they tra track down their prey. The large megalomorphs, the tarantulas, they are actually ambush feeders. And so they will spin silk, but the silk is to line the burrows they live in and to um, make things such as the pillowcase that the female uses to lay her eggs in. So now the female tarantula in springtime lays somewhere between 100 to 150 eggs in this little pillowcase. I have here as an example, if you can see them in here, I know the reflection, those white little sacks are the actual egg cases. These were emptied out. Uh, the female will then push them out of her burrow when she cleans the burrow out later in the year. So these I have found at the burrow entrances, but I can show you one other picture here. I have this one of a female tarantula, and she has the egg case there down her body. She's actually kind of perked up in a menacing position, but it's because she is defending that egg case. She's a very good mother. So the female tarantula has these egg cases, or a single egg case, and for about 30 days, slowly those egg cases start to wiggle and hatch. She will actually, in fact, during the time that she's taking care of them, she will give, um, she will take them out of her burrow and on warm days, put them out in the sunlight. She holds them close to her body so they won't get wet and bacteria on them. Um, she did, like I said, she's a very good mother. And then when they start to wiggle and move inside, she then puts a little slit in that pillowcase and out hatch this approximately 150 tiny pinhead size spiders. They are white when they first come out. And as I said, they're the size of a pinhead. Within the first week, they molt for the first time. This again is where I'm getting back to the fact that they have this exoskeleton and they are growing off the egg sac attached to them when they first come out of their, when they first hatch out of the egg. So now as they, now that they are a week old, they shed that skin or molt. Um, they turn kind of a light beige color and they are voraciously hungry at this point. Now think about this, a spider that size, a little bigger than a pinhead, can only eat something its size. It's not gonna attack a grasshopper or even a housefly, it's too small. So it has to attack something approximately its own size. Now in the wilds are lots of small microscopic other arthropods out there, but remember there's 150 of these still in the same general area. And what we have there next to each other are their brothers and sisters. So what we refer to this is really sibling rivalry. Those young spiders will actually start to attack each other if they do not disperse. Dispersal does not have to be far. Dispersal of these spiders anywhere from six feet to three to four feet away and going underneath a rock and digging a small quarter inch hole and making that their new burrow is fine and starting off life from that point. Now, let's just say that this little spider has found an ideal location, six or eight inches away back from where mom's burrow was, starts to dig its own burrow there, and over the next few years, continues to live there. As the spider grows, it continues to molt more. Within the first year, it's gonna be about the size of a quarter. 
within the next year or so, close to the size of a 50 cent piece. So each year it will continue to grow. If it is a male spider, it will reach maturity somewhere between four to seven years. And that depends a lot about how much it eats and how well it eats. So this now mature spider at seven years old, it is time for it to go out and mate. Let's go back to the female. She is back in, if it's a female spider, she will continue to live in that same burrow and staying there waiting for a mate to come. The difference though is that female spiders will take sometimes as much as between five to 10 years to reach maturity. So their time is much longer. Early I mentioned that the tarantulas are arachnids. The story I'm telling you about them and how they mate and what goes on is pretty much the same for all spiders, all arachnids. So this is not unique just to tarantulas, how their life is uh, played out. The biggest thing that is different is the life expectancy and the lifespan of tarantulas. They live for a much longer period of time. In the rest of the spider world, the spiders I mentioned earlier, crab spiders, jumping spider, wolf spiders, most of them live for a single year. So what happens starts in spring and ends by the following winter. With the tarantula, it goes on much longer. All right, so our male tarantula now has reached maturity. And sometime in July of this year, he came out of his burrow and said, okay, it's time for me to molt where I last time. And what I mean by last time, well, first of all, let me show you a molting. The example I'm gonna show you here are two different things I have. On the, let me move it back a little bit better for you to see. On the one side there, you will see a tarantula. That is a rose-haired tarantula, one sold in the pet trade very commonly. And she's in there all by herself. On the other side, you see two what look like tarantulas. Those are two moltings from the tarantula that you see on the other side. The one I have in the preserved container here is one I had for 14 years. She was 10 years old when I got her. So she was 24 years old when she finally died. And that's known as a rose-haired tarantula. They're quasi-domestic. They're now bred in captivity for the pet trade. Very common to be seen. On this side, as I said, there are the skins. If you look closely, you can see the body portions of where the body the spider pulled itself out, leaving that skin behind. Every time that a spider bolts, it is very vulnerable, so it needs to be protected. Anyway, our male now bolts. One of the things that happens, and another display for you. At the top is a male tarantula, at the bottom a female. I commonly get asked, is the male larger than a female or vice versa? In reality, the female is larger in the sense that she is heavier bodied. Both of these preserved specimens were done in 1995. They have shrunk considerably. They're not in great condition. Um, I continue to use them in displays that I do. But the males at the top, their legs are usually a little longer, more spindly, but the female's body is much more robust, making her heavier. So that male tarantula you see at the top, I want you to look closely at it. I'm gonna put my finger across here. And at this front leg here, if you look right at this joint, you see kind of a little notch sticking down. That's a hook underneath his front leg. We'll talk about that. That hook that's under the leg, I refer to sometimes as a nuptial hook. Um, the reason being is when he sheds his skin for the last time, that male spider gets a hook on both of those front legs. And those hooks are used in the mating process. So he's now come out of his burrow, he has come out and made a web on the ground. On that web on the ground, he then secretes the sperm that he will use. And he then uses what are known as pedipelps. If you look at spiders, they have eight legs, as all spiders do. But they have what look like two small legs in the front of their body, or two arms. Actually, those are their pedipelps. Those pedipelps are sensing organs. Those pedipelps are used in drawing in food. They're used in defending themselves. Um, they have tiny hairs on them. They pick up uh, chemical responses. So many things like that. But in the male spider at this time, they also have two small syringes at the end of the pedipelps, which the male spiders 
takes that sperm from that sperm web he has just made and he inserts it into his pedipalps. His pedipalps now become his reproductive organs. And off he goes looking for a female tarantula. The female tarantulas live in burrows. And this is just kind of a quick example. I've got four different ones there that you can see. These are the kind of burrows they live in in the ground. Each one of those, if you look, are lined with some silk around the entrance. So you can see the silking around them. Also, the silk goes down inside, making it much easier for the spiders to slide in and out of those burrows. Those burrows are about the size of a quarter. So our male tarantula goes out looking for those burrows. He comes upon one, and what he does first is he slowly approaches and he taps gently at the entrance of it. We believe that he possibly finds it because of pheromones, uh, although he is wandering con constantly for about two months from the time he has spun out that web from mid-August through, let's say, mid-October. And so uh, during that wandering time, there's a chance he can always stumble over a burrow. But I believe that there's probably some pheromones given off also. When he finds the burrow, he will go up to it. He will tap on the entrance of it, basically putting out a little bit of a drumming beat saying, Oh, sweetheart, are you home? And I'm here for a date. And so he's asking her to come on out and mate with him. The female may or may not respond to her. I've seen times where females have rushed to the top and forced him away. I've seen times where they have ignored him completely and never come out of the burrows, and he wanders away on his own. And I have been fortunate over the years I have done this. I have watched them five times in the wilds actually mate with each other. Now, in my original studies of these spiders, there were several more myths that I came to find out about, and I hope that I break those myths for you tonight. One of them is that after mating, the female spider eats the male. Well, I thought this was a for sure situation. In the late 1980s was the first time that I happened to see a male tarantula approach a burrow, coax a female out. She, he backed away, she came out. They both met each other. They put their legs up against each other, it was like shaking hands almost. Slowly then he approached and moved into her. He used those two hooks on his front legs to hook her fangs. He bent her backwards into an L position. This is my hand and that is the female tarantula. She would have been pushed up by him. The two would have come out, intermixed with them, met, met each other. Then he comes up and pushes her back like this. His pedipalps are then free underneath here to inseminate the epigeum, or the opening of the pore in the, in the um, abdomen of the female. So he then fertilizes the eggs, or he in, inserts the sperm. He does not fertilize the eggs, he inserts the sperm. At that point, he is um, takes from probably about 30 seconds to three minutes. I have watched him in nature again, 30 seconds, then he breaks apart. Remember that together he'll back down like this. She backs down. He starts to back away in this direction. She backs away in the other direction. She returns to her burrow, which is a foot away, and he goes off wandering on his own. I believe that he goes off wandering on his own to look for other females to mate with. So he may mate more than once in the same season. The female returns to the burrow. In the case of the female, she also may mate with more than one male. Now, I mentioned that over the time, I've seen this five times in the wilds where the male and females have mated. I've seen one time that the same hole, the burrow, two weeks apart, where a different male approached that burrow. Uh, the one time the female approached, um, I mean, the male approached, mated. Two weeks later, I was in the same area again, still observing the same spiders, and a male spider again approached that burrow, and I was wondering what's going to happen. And I said, maybe this is when that female spider comes out and eats the male. Not at all. Male came in, tapped on the opening. She came out. They made it again. So now you're talking about uh, the female mating with two different males that season. Um, and then they both wandered away. In all five occasions that I've seen them do this, the male has always walked away. The female never ate the male. When I saw this happen the first time, I thought it was some aberration. I was trying to call people to let them know, hey, guess what? Saw the situation where the male didn't get eaten. Because again, it's been repeated and repeated about how she devours the male. Now, I am not saying that a female tarantula would not eat a male tarantula. 
Remember, tarantulas eat all forms of arthropods. What I am saying is that the mating situation is not what causes this to happen. The fact that they have mated, she does not devour him for that purpose. Um, so I then also, twice in captivity, had a female tarantula and used two different males to mate with her. And in both cases, in a small terrarium, she receded to her end where her burrow was, and he receded to the opposite end of the terrarium. This was in a situation where he had no escape, and she still did not eat him. So I think there's pretty much proof that the female does not eat the male after mating. All right, now, the one thing that does happen, though, is that male spider is now towards the end of his life. At the end of this season, usually November or December, that male spider will die. Remember me telling you about my spider in captivity. I had that for several months, came all the way through January. And one day I looked in the cage, this is when I was 19 years old, I'm looking around and the spider is shriveling up and it was obviously dying. And I looked at it, oh my God, what did I do? I fed it crickets, I gave it water. How do I keep it alive? Not knowing anything about it, not knowing at that time that it was a male spider, um, and not knowing that it had just met the end of its life. There was nothing I could do about keeping it alive. But as time went on and I learned these things, I learned about what those hooks were on its legs. And this spider did have those hooks at the time. Um, so back to our male spider, he's gonna meet his demise. That female, remember now, has returned to the burrow. And this is again where she is going to overwinter now. Remember I told you the male inseminated her. But she does not have any eggs in her body at that time. The female does not develop the eggs until winter time and going into spring. At that time, that stored up sperm that is in her body, she will decide whether or not she wishes to give birth to those spiders or lay those eggs. And it's probably based on the fact of whether or not winter was not too severe. She was able to eat well before developing those eggs that she's healthy, that she's not been attacked, that the weather conditions are not so bad or she's been flooded out of where her burrow was. All of those things probably play some influence in the fact that she decides, I will fertilize these eggs and I will take care of this. For all you ladies out there, you wanna talk about you know, having complete control of birthing rights, uh, the spiders would be the ones to give you um, that example in the na nature's world. So in any case, um, this spider will decide then. In the case that she does, it will just repeat now to the spinning of that uh, silk uh, pillowcase, the laying of the eggs, and starting the whole cycle over again. Remember, the female will live past that to 25 years old. So whereas a male dies at about seven, six to seven years old, the female will live on to as long as 25 years. It's possible in some species, in fact, they have gone to 30 years. In another species, they only live 10 to 15 years. Remember, I told you there were 850 species of tarantulas in the world. So what I'm telling you about today, scientific name is Anthoponella, try to say that again. Anthonopelma iodius is the one found on Mount Diablo, it is the only species found in Northern California. Um, for those of you who are listening today that are from Contra Costa County, the easiest place to see them is Mount Diablo. But you can see them anywhere through the Diablo Range, down by Del Valle Reservoir in the East uh, Alameda County. Uh, they also go all the way down towards San Jose and over into the San Mateo Hills. Uh, they can be seen in San Mateo County, down in um, uh, Henry Co. Park. Um, and further south, all the way down to the Pinnacles, the Coast Range, and then down to San Luis Obispo. So uh, the, this particular species is throughout the California Coast Range. It is also found in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, and it is found on the other side of the Sierra Nevadas in uh, the Great Basin, as far as Utah. So the uh, uh, Anf Anthonopelma iodius uh, has got a very large range. Um, there is some talk, in fact, that the Coast Range one, the one that we have at Mount Diablo, the one that goes down the coast to San Luis Obispo, may be a separate species, but there's not been enough study, and they're gonna do work with DNA and see if this will possibly be a separate species. In the United States, there's at least 33 identified species of tarantulas. 
found throughout the Western United States, uh, particularly desert areas um, and drier areas. Of these 33 species, they all belong to that same genus, Amphinopelma. The species is different, but the, every one of them belongs to that genus. Those are the only ones we have in Northern California, and none of them are dangerous to human beings. Now, a common thing I get from people is about these tarantulas is, and you have the tarantulas, you've told us about their life history and so forth, but do they have any enemies? And probably the one that's most notorious and that most people have heard about, and that would be the tarantula hawk. Let me see if I can get those up there. And the tarantula hawk is a wasp. I hope you can see those clearly. Blackish blue metallic bodies. I know they look black there. Again, these are over 30 years old, these specimens. They can grow up to two inches long. Most are between an inch to inch and a half. Uh, they have the orange wings. There are multiple species of tarantula hawks. And there are several look-alike wasps that are not necessarily tarantula hawks. Uh, a little bit on the sideline on wasps. A lot of people are not aware of this, but all wasps are predators. All adult wasps feed on pollen and they help pollinate flowers and plants. They're just like bees or butterflies, all the other insects that pollinate things, flower to flower. But the adult female, in order to have a prodigy, has to have a victim to lay her eggs on. And for that reason, all wasps have a particular type of prey that they feed on, or the, I should say the larva feeds on. Uh, in this case, the tarantula hawk or the tarantula wasp, pespis wasp, feeds only on tarantulas. It's unique to them. And so it will attack a tarantula. It will sting that tarantula and paralyze it. This is the same thing all the other wasps are doing with their prey, though, also. They only paralyze it. They do not kill it. They then lay a, an egg or eggs. In the case of the tarantula hawk, she lays a single egg on the bottom of the paralyzed tarantula drags it to a burrow, buries it. The egg hatches within a day. The larva hatches out and proceeds to eat that tarantula, starting at the legs and eating inward, eating the vital organs approximately 30 days later. So it has had a fresh meal for that full time that it has been devouring that tarantula. At that time, it pupates or forms a pupa. The pupa stays in there over winter underground and in springtime will hatch out again where the male and female wasp will then mate and the, um, the whole process will start again throughout that summer months and into fall. Now, just as an example, for those of you who know or recognize what a mud dauber is, your mud dauber wasp, for instance, makes those mud nests up underneath the eaves of your house. They are spider wasps also. They just happen to attack smaller spiders. And those little mud nests they have are little um, oval, or not oval, but long tubular, um, uh, areas where they put the spider's body in. There are several spider's bodies, in fact, and an egg on each one. So each one of the little tubes can have four or five, and four or five larvae can hatch uh, can hatch out of each one of those. Uh, so it's better not to knock them down in the wintertime, or you're killing the mud dog or wasp also, because that uh, chrysalis or cocoon, or whatever you want to call it, from the larva will then be destroyed. Um, there are certain wasps that attack crickets, certain wasps that attack caterpillars, certain wasps attack certain grasshoppers. Each one of these has their own prey that they feed on. So I often tell people it's a jungle out there, folks, um, and it's going on in your backyard. So these are some of the examples of some of the creatures. One of the last things here I want to show you, we're getting down towards the ends, and that is also about size of these tarantulas. The one I showed you is. Um, Maybe the size of the palm of my hand or local one. I often have people when I show them a live one, they say, oh yeah, that's a little one. I remember the one I saw crossing the road. It was about twice that size. Well, the one I showed you is the maximum size of the ones we have in these areas. But the first time we see one of these, they sure do look bigger than they are. Now, one I saw when I was 19 years old, I was telling people it was at least six inches across. It was huge. Well, the reality was about three inches across like all of them. Um, but what I would like to show you is this one, and hopefully not too much reflection off of this. That particular spider is the world's largest tarantula. 
is the one often referred to as a bird-eating spider. It is from South America, um, and it is the, um, the largest. They are almost the size of a small dinner plate, uh, which are often referred to, but their name is a total misnomer. They are not necessary. They are not a bird eating spider at all. Well, I should not say at all. If for some reason a small bird came near them, yes, they would pounce on it and eat it. There was a painting done of one of these in Europe in the 1880s, and it had captured a hummingbird. Whether that painting was from a real observation or just done that way, I don't know. But because of that, that name bird eating spider came about. They actually live on the basin of northern. Um, northern Amazon area from uh, Brazil into Suriname and um, Guiana, those areas in there. And that particular spider hunts, again, just like our local spider does as an ambush feeder. They are nighttime hunters. They hunt at night. They do kind of quasi-hibernate the winter, not the tropical ones, but ours. Um, and they uh, will attach like large cockroaches or wood cockroaches, animals like that. So, Again, these tarantulas are uh, really a, a creatures that are not harmful to people uh, and should be well respected. As I said in the beginning of my presentation, Wes mentioned that I really try to debunk a lot of mythology about spiders in general, but also about uh, reptiles and snakes in particular. Uh, the major phobias I've been told that people have, the number one actually is the one I'm doing right now, although I don't have a live audience uh, in the sense that I can see you. And that is public speaking is the number one people thing people are afraid of. Number two, though, are snakes. And number three are spiders, phobias of those two things. And it's sad because those are animals are so imperative and so non-threatening in reality. Uh, that That's the one thing that really, um, uh, I guess, really bothers me. And I hope that I debug some of those fears you have today. Last thing I'm going to do here before we go to a Q&A, I do have a live rose-haired tarantula. I showed you the one that died a few years ago. I have replaced her, and I do want to take this out and let you guys see her here. She's there in my hand. I would not be handling an animal that is poisonous or dangerous, and the word really is venomous. Poison is something that a a mushroom has or a plant you 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 ingest poison uh, venomous creatures inject you with the venom but as you can see she's sitting on my hand here i'll see if i can get her to move a little bit where you can see her move okay come on sweetheart crawl down there she goes down to my other hand um and again totally harmless creature um I don't recommend these necessarily as pets for people. The reason I have this one is truly because of the presentations I do about tarantulas and to help people overcome some of their arachnophobias. So this one, I will put her back. Come on back in there. I hope today's presentation gave you an insight to the life of these really wonderful creatures. Uh, if you still want to see them, it's late in the season, but there are still a few out, especially with the good weather we've been having. Um, going out of Mitchell Canyon on up um, on the Mitchell Canyon Road to Black Point, there's a chance of seeing them. Best time is early evening, 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. It's getting dark by 7 now, so even going at 3.30 to say 6.30 is a good chance that you may see the males starting to come out. There are still some burrows that are open along the trails. Uh, there's always the chance that you can drive up Northgate Road very slowly. They will cross the road sometimes. You'll see them on the sides of the roads. Most people just drive right by them and whiz right by them. So with that, I would like to turn this back to Wes, and he's going to head up the question or Q&A. Well, Michael, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. To, to think that you have been doing this for 40 years um, really uh makes me marvel at the number of people that you've reached uh over the years to introduce them to these uh to these creatures and their their habits and and their lifestyles so thank you thank you for that great service um it's uh it was wonderful to listen to your presentation all right thank you absolutely and as you mentioned uh we have uh we have an opportunity uh, that i hope will take good advantage of uh to ask uh questions from the audience 
as you might imagine, we've already had uh, 18 questions posed. So we're going to try to get through as many of these as we can. Um, if you have a question in the audience, uh, just use the Q&A function that's a, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then we will uh, we'll try to uh, try to have Michael answer as many of these as uh, as time allows. Hey, um, Wes, let me mm -hmm. add that if we don't get through them all and you have their emails, send them to me and I will still answer them for them. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so the first question is the one I think is probably on on most people's minds, and it's where you were where you were going uh, with your concluding comments. Uh, but the question comes from Vicky asking, uh, when we're out hiking, moving at that hiking pace, uh, what are your tips? What what are we actually looking for on the ground yeah. to identify either the tarantulas themselves or where they've been or or what you might be looking to, to find them while you're out on your hike? Okay, two things. Um, you will see the actual tarantula and you can't miss it. It's too large to miss if it's out on the trail. So you hike along the trail, you keep your eyes open on the ground and you look to the sides also, just in case. If they're really up in some brush, you're not going to see them. Uh, they, 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 they are camouflaged enough. But the, where you see them just crossing out, and it's, it's by hit or miss. That's why they usually go for a couple mile hike. Uh, I believe that the night we took your group out for the hike, uh, they end up seeing six of them crossing the trails. Uh, like I said, Mitchell Canyon to Black Point, or to what's known as the Globe Lily Trail, which is off of the, the Mitchell Canyon Road also and out to one other known as uh, Red, Red Road. Those are excellent places to hike to see them. You also look for those small 25 cent size holes on the ground, that not just any hole, and they have to be really round and lined with silk. And you know that that's where the females are probably at. Terrific. Tara has a, a follow-up question about those burrows. Uh, you mentioned that the burrow is about the size of a quarter visually. Yes. Um, what is so that's the size of the opening what what does the burrow look like um inside what's the depth of the burrow what 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 does that living environment look like most of the times they're 12 to 18 inches deep and they will sometimes have one small um side channel uh, off of them uh and the at the bottom it is commonly made into a j shape so that if moisture or water gets in there the spider can still kind of back up into a dry area at the bottom of the hole the reason for the small off channels, often a spider will capture its prey because it hunts near the entrance of its burrow, comes out at night to hunt. It's an ambush feeder, so a cricket comes by, it grabs it. It will often drag it back into the hole, and it will sometimes put the um, X leftovers in the side of the uh, little side hole, and then it also then occasionally will clean out its burrow. Great. We have three questions about geography. I think there's some excitement about trying to trying to find uh, tarantulas. Uh, Tina, Patricia, and one anonymous uh, person ask. So first of all, uh, you mentioned all the different places regionally. Uh, is is it possible to spot tarantulas up in Marin County? Uh, number one. Number two is Patricia writes that she saw one many years ago in the Los Altos Hills. Yes. Is that the same species yes. that you mentioned? Yes. Uh, and then I'll let you answer those two, and then there's a third coming. Okay. Um, and it's a good point, that question on Marin. To my knowledge, tarantulas stop at Contra Costa County. The Carquina Scenic Straits and the Golden Gate. Marin County does not have tarantulas. Sonoma does not. Going up over into um, Solano County and north. Now, I'm saying this with some caveat because maybe the coast range uh, heading up in through Napa or over to Calusa may still have some. I know that the foothills over towards like where the Sierra Buttes are, those foothills have them. Up at Folsom, Sacramento, they have them. So, um, so yes, they are found in some other areas. All of the range south along the coast ranges, they are found in the hills. Not on the moist side, to my knowledge, of like the Santa Cruz Mountains or the Redwood Forest areas, but the dry oak woodlands forest, those areas are very good for them. So that covers that. There is a spider, though, found in the northern parts of California that is a megalomorph, referred to as the false tarantula sometimes, about half the size of our tarantula, looks like one, called a calisoga spider. Not calistoga, but calisoga. If you look that one up, you'll see how much like a spider, um, tarantula, because they're very similar in appearance and they're very large. It's the largest spider in the marine area. 
you mentioned in your comments uh, Folsom. Yes. Uh, the third question uh, is about uh, something uh, referred to as the Johnny Cash tarantula found in Folsom. <laughs> is that uh, does that sound familiar? Is that the same species as those found here locally? Okay. Uh, Dr. Chris Hamilton, who's at the University of Idaho right now, has done the most recent studies on our spider included, but he did limited spiders on the Mount Diablo Coast Range. In fact, he is the one that gave me the information that he believes if we could do further studies, it may be a separate species in our coast range. And I'm hopefully that they're going to have the people who want to do that eventually, still in my lifetime. In any case, um, in the process of studying Iodius in the uh, Sierra Nevadas, he came across a very dark black, a little bit smaller, but similar. It was strange that did DNA tested back, came out that's a new separate species, not the same as Iodius, because it was found in that Folsom area. He being a big fan of Johnny Cash, he named it. He got the chance to name that spider. It's still an Anfo, huh, Anfo Penel, Pelma, I, um, Johnny Cashy. So it's still the same genus, but a separate species. Perfect. On that subject of uh, common names, familiar names, uh, folks uh, are interested to know what is the common name of the tarantula that inhabits Mount Diablo? Well, they've applied the word desert tarantula, but because there's, I don't like that because there's so many in the desert. I've often just called it the California tarantula for Northern California. Again, that's a misnomer because it's found other places. Um, in, in my lifetime of doing this for 40 years, that spider has had five different names applied to it and then removed and then reapplied. And so that, again, that's why I'm saying this is still up in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle asks uh, a question that, that uh, comes up in many of our talks, which is about the, the impact of climate change. Um, curious to know how climate change is either affecting where you'll find tarantulas regionally uh, and if it's affecting either the timing or any of the specific behaviors in their mating patterns. Now, this is something I didn't even think of 10 to 15 years ago, all right? If not that climate change wasn't starting then, it just, I never dreamed about how it might affect tarantulas. What I can tell you from observations, you remember these are small, short periods of time. We're not talking 100 years to be able to see this. But during the drought, we saw something very unusual, at least for me, it was unusual. When I used to lead hikes, the hikes started usually September 1st and they ran until November 1st. I never saw, if you saw a tarantula out August 25th, that was an aberration. When the drought hit, we started to see tarantulas, the males coming out October 5th, I mean, excuse me, August 15th, August 5th, August 1st, finally, July 31st. When I say tarantulas coming out, I always had the rule of thumb. I had to see three more, three or more on the same night. And I was seeing three or more much earlier in the season. Now, also during that time, we saw the numbers decrease as far as the number of males we would see on our hikes. There were hikes where we saw none. There were hikes where we saw one or two. Right? That was during this last year, we had a very wet winter. So I started this year in July looking for them. We didn't see any until about August 16th, still earlier than they used to be, but it seemed like the weather was maybe pushing them back a little bit more, which means to me, oh, also, when we saw them come out earlier, we saw them disappearing much earlier by October 15th, that you saw far less. I'm feeling that this one may push them a little bit further into October because they came out a little bit later. It was a wetter year. Again, we're supposed to have this El Nino year this year. It's supposed to be what? I'm going to really watch to see the observations next year. The other thing I cannot explain for this year, the number of male tarantulas seen has been extraordinary again. On our hikes, we're seeing six to 12 tarantulas each time. I mean, there's some nights probably four, but they, the highest night was 17 one night that the group saw. And uh, the lowest number has been six to the people I've talked to. So for some reason, we are at the same time though, the number of burrows decreased this year. So this thing's from a year to year and it's hard to predict or know, but I think her question, somebody could for the next 30 years could do a study would come up with a more succinct answer. Thank you. Uh, Kevin asks um, a question about the longevity of tarantulas, seven to 25 years. Um, is there anything particular to their lifestyle that you would attribute uh, that length, uh, that lifespan? No smoking, no drinking. I don't know. Clean life. I, no, um, they, no, that's 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 the uh, obviously uh, the genetics. Okay, 
that's what they have. Uh, um, I don't know how you, that's what they're born with exactly. In other words, living 25 for a female is uh, like a female today living 65 to 70, okay? And then, and then we have those who live to 80 and 90 here. I'm sure there's a few that live to 27 years in the tarantula world. Uh, there's those who also, I mentioned that I had the rose hair that lasted 24 years. Um, I also had a rose hair tarantula died at 19 years. So I'm not sure of why she died a little bit earlier. Uh, nothing different done with her or anything else, but still lost her. We have a question here about the different colors of the tarantula, noting that some of the tarantulas can be quite uh, quite light uh, in, in color, others can be quite dark. Uh, is there, what determines the, the color of the tarantula from uh, spider to spider? Back to genetics there, okay? And whatever their parents look like, um, because they're just like human beings. They come in many shades, uh, but particularly our own species. We have from a very lighter brownish tan almost, um, to and sometimes the hairs almost look a little reddish sometimes on them in reflection of the sun uh to very dark almost black looking again with reddish tinged hair sometimes so you have this spectrum of ours we only have the one species in the area so we know that's that they're all the same one same still but they do come in many shades as far as color though tarantulas in terms of the world i showed you the rose haired on the screen you can't see her very well but she truly is a reddish color and i used to have a uh, a beautiful purple tarantula. I won't go into scientific names from South America. Um, we bred those. I had also the um, a red knee tarantulas in the past. So you've got the red uh, with the red legs and so forth. So you've got numerous different colors from around the world. Excellent. I think we have, looking at the clock, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, the first one uh, is, is a great question about the tarantula's place uh, in the ecosystem. So where where do tarantulas um, uh, exist within their ecosystem, and should their numbers either increase or decrease significantly? Um, what would that uh, what impact would that create in the local habitat? Okay, well, their life first of all uh, is connected really tightly with that tarantula hawk wasp. If the tarantula disappeared, so would that wasp from this area. Okay, so you talk about an interconnection there, but they also, as of all spiders, extremely important for keeping biologic control of other arthropods. So, uh, and tarantulas included. So, it's hard to really say why is it the tarantula, is it any one species? In fact, whenever we protect a protected species, I'm not angry about that, but and I'm happy about the fact we do that. But what we are really are doing is not protecting it; we're protecting its habitat that it's in. You know, when you talk about that, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the owl, um, I'm sorry, I um, um, <laughs> can't even think of the neighbor right now, uh, but that, that when they talk about this old growth forest is what they're really protecting, not just that owl. By doing that, you're protecting all the other living things. So with the tarantula, it is the same thing. Also, it is the food, not only of that, it's the food of some other insects and whatnot and creatures, like also things like a coyote, uh, a, um, a skunk they also would attack and eat these things. So they fill a niche there as one of the animals that is both prey and predator. Mm. Wonderful. So, okay, so two last questions. One's a longer one, one's a shorter one, but this okay. last one came in, I think it, it should get should get asked. Okay. So there have been several people interested in uh, the hairs on the tarantulas uh, and specifically what function do they play? Yeah, I did not tell that specifically because I was waiting for the question on this one. All right, yes. Tarantulas do have some irritating hairs on the abdomen. They are used in self-defense. And what happens is that if a predator tries to attack a tarantula, often it will turn and raise up and actually show its fangs and try to spread its legs and look vicious. So the raccoon keeps coming, okay? Tarantula says, uh-oh, now he turns tail and runs. Raccoon comes up, kind of bats him on the backside as he's gonna reach for him. Tarantula freezes, puts his rump up in the air, and using his hind legs, he rubs against his abdomen. A tiny, tiny, you don't even see it, or you've got to look so closely, cloud of dust will kind of arise. They're little microscopic hairs that have little barbs on them, and they are irritating hairs. They can cause, if you were to put your hand on them, if eventually they could enter your skin in a couple of days, you'd have some itching, like a little poison oak or something. In the case of the raccoon though he's putting his head down there so you're getting them into their eyes nose and throat and that causes an immediate irritation the tarantula hoping then it can scurry away 
while the uh, the predator is rubbing its face. No, they are not really dangerous to people. They're somewhat irritating. Now, over the years, I've had them, um, whereas poison oak lasts for a couple of weeks, this lasts for two or three days. They do kind of itch and give little, you know, tiny bump blisters on you. Got it. Great, great okay. hair question. So the, so the last question is a great one to end on. Uh, folks are interested to know what additional resources you might recommend um, to learn more about tarantulas, whether they're field guides or uh, certainly to come out and see one of your talks live, one of your hikes live. Um, what other resources would you recommend the audience um, look into to learn more? Well, obviously the internet cautiously, okay? Because the internet's filled with a lot of BS. <laughs> but um, one of the better local field guides for California, I'll hold up, is part of the natural um, history sections for California. There's only one small part about the tarantula here. And if you bought this one, my edition is already outdated. I hope the new one's already been corrected because in here they don't refer to them as Iodius, in fact. They refer to them as one of the old names um, because this is an older edition. But if you get a newer edition, this is an excellent book for spiders as a whole, though, for California. So if you're interested in spiders, particularly excellent field guide. The whole series by the University of California Natural History Press, I could not uh, say enough about as far as local. Combine that with internet information. Um, like I said, Dr. Um, Chris Hamilton is one of the resources on the internet, that, and I've, you know, I've been fortunate to personally meet him and know him. Um, there's a doctor, there's a, uh, another Dr. Prentice down in Southern California, did work with tarantulas down there. He was out of Riverside. So there's various different people, and as they do more and more work, going out and finding people with those kind of papers that they write will tell you really the real, the real information on tarantulas. Outstanding. And with that, I'll note that several readers uh, use the Q&A function simply to express their appreciation for today's talk, for your enthusiasm, for your passion for the subject, uh, and for sharing it with others. Uh, so I will echo, uh, echo their appreciation as well, and that is a fine note uh, to end on. Um, thank you, Michael, uh, for sharing all of your expertise with the Bay Nature community this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Look uh, forward to it. One keeping more, our eyes for, open for, for and getting out on the trail you, with you. You have my email. I have no problem of you publishing that to Bay Nature members if anybody has further questions on things like this or other things in nature. Outstanding. All right. So everyone, that concludes our Bay Nature talk for the afternoon. Uh, we want to thank you all for donating and attending. Uh, in the coming days, you'll get an email from us with a link to the recording uh, for you to share, uh, and in case there's anything you'd like to see again from Michael's remarks. Thank you again, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great afternoon.